Welcome to New Goals for New Ag, a content partnership with Verdesian on Brownfield. And today we're gonna focus our conversation on biologicals. I'm anchor reporter Megan Grubner. With me today is Kurt Sievers, a technical development manager with Verdesian. Kurt, thank you for taking some time and uh, joining me today. Glad to do it, Megan. Uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, so uh, I'm ready to uh, see what we can get a uh, get on tape and and go for the uh, get the information out there. I guess we are going to dig deep into biologicals today, and it's it's something that's coming up more and more in the ag sector. So when people talk about biologicals, what are they actually referring to? No, that's a that's a great question because, as you say, there are there is a great deal of interest in biologicals and agriculture right now, and for the most part, what we're talking about in in the true sense of of biological products are products that are made with living organisms, and I think that's a really key distinction that we need to remember with these products is that these are living organisms and things that we have to make sure that they stay alive in order for us to get the benefits that the producers are claiming that these products will provide to us out there. So uh, we have to handle them completely in a completely different way. We have to um, store them in a completely different way, apply them in a, in, a little, in a different way in some situations, and be cognizant of the recommendations that are on the labels, just like any other product. We always say, read the label and follow those, those directions. Um, with biologicals, it's particularly important because there's things like storage temperatures that we have to be aware of, application rates, uh, application techniques in some situations where we need to really pay attention with these products because they are alive and we need to keep them that way. So there's an awful lot of different types of organisms that people are working with or companies are working with these days. The vast majority of those probably fall in the category of, of microorganisms, uh, specifically things like bacteria, uh, trichodermas, um, and some of, the, uh, some of the other fungi that are out there. Uh, are, are the, the ones that tend to make up the bulk of the biological products right now. And um, the, the really neat thing about it is um, we've been working with biologicals since the late 1800s, if you can believe that. So uh, this is not something that's brand new. Uh, back in the, the 1800s, eight, late 1800s, we started working with actually rhizobia, and we've been working with them uh, ever since. Uh, we've made some great improvements in application technology and, and those kinds of things over the years. But uh, this is not something that's brand new to agriculture. We've been at it for a long time. It's kind of come and gone over the years. But uh, yeah, we're, we're making progress. I think that's the good news. You mentioned that there's different types, and we're going to talk about that. But do you think that because of the vast and the wide variety of things, that maybe people don't have a full understanding of what they are and how they function? Yeah, I think that's that's a large part of it, Megan, because there is such a, a variety of organisms that are out there in the marketplace right now. Um, it's, it's entirely possible that that's pre presenting a little bit of a potential for confusion among the customer base out there, whether we're talking at the dealer level or, or at the grower level. Um, and again, I think the, the main thing that we need to focus on when it comes to proper use of these products is the label recommendations. That product uh, is either a registered product through EPA or it's a uh, non-registered product depending on the claims that are made for the activity. But um, the label should contain all of the necessary information to store the product, use the product, uh, under the best conditions so that we can get the results that we expect or that the company that's providing the product expects to get. Um, I, you know, I, I keep coming back to that, but it is such a critical difference between these products and what we're used to working with in agriculture with chemistry and fertilizer and, and all those kinds of things. So uh, in order for us to be successful with these products, that's one of the key things that we have to pay attention to uh, with these particular products. So yeah, 
a lot of different kinds of things out there. I've seen some lists that will go up one arm and down the other as far as the products that are on the market right now, but they they do tend to fall into a, a, a few uh, pretty select categories uh, with the, the fungi and the bacillus uh, or bacteria of various kinds. So, um, and the, the really interesting thing about it is uh, even if you've got two different kinds of bacteria, you're not necessarily going to see the same handling instructions. Just because it's a bacteria doesn't mean that it's this, you're going to have to deal with it the same way, uh, regardless of what that product is. So again, that label will tell you what you need to know to be able to successfully use that product. Can we talk about some of the different types then and dig deeper into that and their uses uh, when it comes to biologicals? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think probably the most prevalent group that's out there right now is the bacteria. And there's two different categories of bacteria. We have gram positive and gram negative bacteria. What, those are uh, the, the gram positive or are, are, tend to be spore forming bacteria. So that they're a little bit easier to work with because that spore stage that they form is a, is a protected stage, so to speak. It can withstand uh, utilization in a variety of different ways. Uh, we can put a lot of those in furrow with a starter fertilizer, for example. Uh, we can apply them uh, foliar with a variety of different kinds of materials, uh, or we can put them on seed and they will, they will tend to last uh, much longer than the non-spore forming gram negative bacteria, which are what we refer to as vegetative cells or living cells that we have to maintain certain conditions. And again, labels will tell us what those conditions are in order to maintain the viability of those organisms. So uh, they tend to be a little bit restricted as far as the kinds of applications that we can use because we are, are actually working with a living cell. So we have to pay attention to things like, you know, are they compatible with starter fertilizers? Um, are we dealing with something in a tank mix where we're applying a foliar application that may present a problem to us? Um, one of the things that I run into all the time uh, with the rhizobia in particular is the, the desire to either tank mix for inferno application or apply on seed with certain kinds of products. And one of the things that's common across the majority of agricultural products that are non-biologicals is they tend to include a component that's referred to as an antimicrobial. And that's to keep things from growing inside the jug for that product that might, if we were to get molds or fungi or something like that in there, uh, so the, they load them up in some situations with a fairly significant dose of, a, of an antimicrobial formulation component. And of course, anything that's antimicrobial is not necessarily going to be a good thing <laughs> for us to mix with biologicals. So we have to pay attention to those kinds of things when we're starting to mix biologicals with other products to do different kinds of applications. Uh, starter fertilizers, uh, the biologicals tend to get along a lot better with the low salt varieties of starters, um, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, and then the other thing we have to pay attention to in a lot of situations is water pH. Some of these things are very sensitive to pH. And so applications for on seed treatment or even liquid or a water in furrow application without starter uh, anything else that we're putting into that mixture, we need to take into consideration when we use biologicals. The, the key to this, Megan, is we're spending money on these products, right? And if we're not paying attention to the things that we need to, to make sure that that money that we're spending is being utilized to the best advantage of that product, we might as well not spend the money it's, you know, we're just not going to get the response that we expect to see. And I, and I believe in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to uh, consistency of performance, a lot of the problems that we see with biologicals and their consistency of performance relates back to these kinds of potential issues. Um, but yeah, uh, beyond, the, beyond the bacteria, then we've got a lot of uh, fungal products. Um, there's uh, Oh, the trichodermas, there's um, 
the there's some ascomycetes. I mean, there's there's just a whole variety of different kinds of critters out there that we're working with. And the, you know, even though they have different requirements and they have different types of activities, I think the main thing to remember is we've got to follow what they say on the label to make sure that we can utilize, regardless of what the, the organism is, follow the label directions so that we have the ability to utilize these products to the, their best advantage. And if there's questions about compatibility in specific uses, contact the manufacturer and they should be able to provide you with answers as far as what kind of compatibility their products have with various kinds of application techniques and uh, tanks, potential tank mix partners. So kind of a long drawn out uh, response to your question. And uh, uh, you know, the categories, like I say, are, are fairly broad, but um, there's a lot of different things in each one that we can work with. And Again, the, the manufacturer's information on the label is going to be the key to success. We talked about this a little bit, but anything else that we need to consider when we're using biologicals in order for us to get the most out of them in our operations? Yeah, I, you know, I think the, 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 like I say, the key to success with biologicals is making sure that we're thinking about them a little bit differently. We've got to keep that in mind that these things are not chemicals, they're not fertilizers, they're alive. And if they're not alive when we put them in the field, we're just not going to get the response that we expect to see. So pay particular attention to any of the literature that you have about that product, anything that you seen off, you know, off the internet, you know, from the company's websites about their products. And of course, the label will give us, you know, the majority of the information that we need to be successful. Uh, pay particular attention to uh, it, situations where we're mixing these products with other things. And, um, you know, those are the, the kinds of situations where we tend to see when we have problems with performance with biologicals, a lot of times those are causes for that lack of performance. We're just not paying attention to the things that we need to when we're making those applications to ensure that these things are you know, alive and viable when they get into the soil or they hit the leaf surface uh, or we, we apply them to the seed. Uh, the other thing that's kind of particular or peculiar, peculiar about um, seed applications uh, is we do need to pay attention to uh, how long these things can survive on seed. Are they able to last for a week, two weeks, a month, three months? You know, when, whenever we apply these things, we've got to take into consideration how long is it going to be before that seed goes in the ground. And, uh, you know, that's been an issue for us that we've wrestled with with rhizobia for a long time. But most of these other biologicals have the same kinds of limitations as we're dealing with with rhizobia. Some of them are much longer. They can survive on the seed for, you know, especially with the uh, the spore formers out there, it's going to survive on seed almost indefinitely. But there's a lot of others out there that they're gone in a, within a few days, depending on what other materials you're putting on the seed at the same time. So you know, very much like a lot of other parts of what we do in agriculture, we've got to pay attention to all of the pieces that we're putting together to make sure that we get the best results that we possibly can. Does that come into play when farmers have, like when farmers should be thinking about their expectations for how biologicals perform or the perf improvements or uh, how it impacts their crop? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the, the expectations that a lot of folks have around biologicals, of, of course, are set by the manufacturers and the claims that those manufacturers make about these products. Um, one of the things that I see, you know, and, and I've you know been doing this for almost 20 years now with biologicals. And so I've seen a, a variety of kinds of claims come across, you know, and uh, I understand, you know, a lot of these companies are relatively new, they're startups, and they, they're they under a crunch to, to try to make some money for the investors that have set them up in business. Yeah, I, I get all that. But we really need to do in the biological space, because we have a history in biologicals of the perception of snake oils, right? 
Uh, I think that's one of the one of the the hurdles that we still need to overcome in a lot of ways because of the past expectations that people have put on these products. So setting real expectations from the manufacturer from the, the time they make that product available to producers, to dealers out there, setting realistic expectations is going to be a key to how biologicals are accepted in the marketplace out there and how their success is perceived. If we're making you know, wild claims based on information that we find in literature rather than working with the specific strain of organism that we're providing in our product, um, we can miss it completely. Um, biologicals tend to be very strain specific in their activity. And just because there's information out there in the literature that says a certain genus and species of bacteria provides certain kinds of benefits, that doesn't mean that every single one of those organisms in that genus and species is going to provide the same benefits. Within genus and species, we have strains. And strains are the level at which we have to look at what the activity is. When you look at most of the, the good literature that's been provided out there, they will tell you not only the genus and species of the organism that they're studying, but they will also give you a strain designation. And unless you're looking at exactly that same strain, there's no guarantee that you're gonna see the same kinds of activity. Uh, when I do uh, presentations about biologicals in front of uh, live audiences, I, I like to use an example. Everybody knows what E. coli is. And the perception of E. coli is that it's a really bad bacteria, right? It's just not good for us in a lot of different ways. But there are actually strains of E. coli that are very, very good at stimulating plant growth have absolutely no problems as far as human health is concerned, okay? But if I'm coming out with a product and I tell you that it has E. coli in it, guess what? You're probably not gonna buy it, even though it might be the best thing that ever came down the pike from a plant growth perspective, that perception that we have of that particular genus and species is so bad that even though we might have a strain that's very good at what we want it to do, people just aren't gonna buy it. And that's the kind of thing that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about any kind of biologicals. The, the activity that we see with these things is very strain specific. So just because you've got a Bacillus subtilis doesn't mean it's gonna do the same thing as this Bacillus subtilis over here. So setting those realistic expectations for performance is a very strong key to being able to make these products part of what we're doing in agriculture and not, not only now, but into the future. So yeah, making sure that the claims that we're making are something that people are gonna be able to see in the field based on actual research with that particular strain of organism in the field so that people know what they can expect to see and make it realistic. It ain't gonna work 100% of the time. There isn't anything in agriculture that works 100% of the time, just because of all the variability that we deal with in the field out there. Heard as we wind down our conversation today about biologicals, I think it, it's smart to talk about how they can fit in with nutrient use efficiency efforts and sustainable or sustainable agriculture. Can you kind of give us an overview about how that fits into that system? Sure, you bet. Uh, I think the one of the, the the really great perceptions about biologicals that we're working with right now is the fact that they are part of a sustainable production practice. Um, they're naturally occurring. Um, just a, a word of caution on some of that. There are some companies out there now that are starting to look at can they genetically modify these some of these organisms to get them to produce certain kinds of materials, uh, metabolites or activities that they're, they desire, uh, express those things a little bit more, uh, a little better than what they, na they naturally would. Um, uh, that, that's something that the, uh, the, the 
problems that, that, that might exist or benefits that might exist with that or something that need to be looked at over a long period of time. We just don't know how these things are gonna be, how these things might affect what we're trying to do out there in the environment when we modify them uh, intentionally. So just a, a word of caution. I'm not saying that these are necessarily bad things, but we just need to be a little bit more careful when we've changed something other than from what it naturally occurring the way it exists. So just be aware that that's something that's occurring out there in the marketplace right now. But back to the, you know, the sustainability and the nutrient use efficiency part of this thing, these organisms, you know, have a, like I say, have a, a wide variety of kinds of activities that we can take advantage of. Making nutrients available that exist in the soil that are uh, tied up, uh, you know, chemically bonded that some of the organisms produce materials, metabolites that can un undo those bonds and make that that uh, fertilizer, that nutrient that the plant needs more available. These are great products. They're allowing us to take advantage of what exists in the soil uh, that's bound up that the plant does not have activity or have available to it, but we can find ways to utilize that material. The, the thing that we have to keep in mind is as we mine the soil and take these nutrients out, eventually we're going to get to a point where we've used up what we have available to us out there and it's gonna need to be replaced. So while these things can be a, a, a fantastic tool to utilize to make nutrients available, we have to look at that total nutrient balance in the soil and how that's affected by the use of these products and what that does to us or, or for us in the long term. So when we talk about sustainability, we wanna be able to produce crops in a field for a long period of time. That's To me, that's what sustainability means. But at the same time, we also have to be aware of what we're, what we're the way that we're affecting what's happening in the soil, whether it's through a chemist, chemical or biological products, we, we do have to pay attention to that part of it as well. Uh, from nutrient use efficiency standpoint, uh, I always say that rhizobia are the ultimate in nutrient use efficiency because you're putting a bacteria that exists and in, in, into a system that has existed for centuries between legumes and rhizobia. And that rhizobia takes nitrogen from the air and turns it into a form that the plant can utilize. It's not pulling anything out of the soil in order to be able to do that. So we're contributing nutrients to the plant. The only other way we can get them in terms of nitrogen which is from the atmosphere. And that's where we get most of our nitrogen, obviously, for fertilizer use and things like that. We've got a bacteria that actually does that for us. We're starting to look at other kinds of organisms to do the same thing in other crops. To me, those are the ultimate in nutrient use efficiency because you're not artificially adding anything into that production system, but you're getting the benefits of the, what those organisms can do in nutrient production for the crop. So, uh, you know, we're 100 percent efficient when it comes to that part. And there isn't anything else out there that can make a claim like that as far as nutrient use efficiency is concerned. But again, a lot of these products that are helping us with nutrient availability and nutrient utilization by the plant uh, are a great way for us to take advantage of what we can do with the nutrients that are already existing in the soil. But we got to keep in mind that as we utilize what's there, eventually we do get to a point where we need to go back in and start to replace those nutrients. So long-term strategy, uh, nitrogen production by microbes is a great strategy. Let's just, you know, on the other nutrients that we're not able to pull straight out of the atmosphere, we have to take out of the soil. Uh, we just got to keep in mind what's going to happen long-term with those. So uh, I, I, I love the idea of, you know, utilizing what exists in the ground, but we just got to remember eventually we're going to get to a spot where we're going to have to start to replace a little bit. So, yeah, it's, it's a great, uh, great way for people to take advantage of things that they've been doing, you know, as far as storing nutrients in the soil for a long period. But, uh, and, you know, like I say, there's, there's no better nutrient use efficiency than, than rhizobia and nitrogen and some of the other new nitrogen uh, creation technologies that are uh, organisms, I should say, that are being utilized out there. Um, yeah, we just got to figure out what's the best way to do it all. And that's the fun part about working with biologicals. 
Kurt, what resources are available to farmers from Rhodesia who want to learn more about biologicals, who want to see if this is a right fit uh, for their operation? Where do they go? Well, uh, our website has a, a variety of information, of course, about the products that we offer. Um, and there's uh, you know, ways that you can get in touch with the, uh, our local people that work in the area that the, uh, that the producer may be in. Our account managers are, are very well versed in biologicals and uh, at least on the products that we have to offer. We do have one other avenue that people can take advantage of, and that's our Nutrient Use Efficiency University. And this is a series of courses that are available for people online. And there's uh, quite a few of them that we've added in the last few years regarding um, utilization and benefits of biologicals. Uh, there's one course that, that I've done uh, in the last year or so that just an introduction to biologicals covers a lot of the same kinds of things that we've talked about today. So some really good resources out there and uh, we invite people to come and take advantage of them uh, and talk to our folks in the field too. They're, uh, they're a good resource for, for uh, information about biologicals and I'll answer phone calls too. <laughs> And we'll definitely get the link up uh, to the Nutrient Use Efficiency University as well uh, awesome. for folks to easily access that. Kurt, thank you for your time today. You bet. It's been a blast. This is one of the things that I love to talk about. And uh, like I say, I've been working with these things for almost 20 years now. So, uh, you know, the gray hair has uh, been earned. But uh, um, yeah, it's something that I'm passionate about. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity, Megan. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you for watching New Goals for New Ag, a content partnership with Verdesian. I'm Megan Grebner for Brownfield.